Hey folks, it's time for another This Week in Photo episode. This is a continuation of our travel tips for photographers in 2019. This is TWIP. Hey, welcome back to another episode of TWIP. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today on the show are two photographers who you may have seen on a previous episode of This Week in Photo. I've got Mr. Matt Granger and Mr. Lee Herbert here again to, uh, to talk through some of their best travel tips for photographers in 2019. We did a show before this, um, actually a couple of weeks ago, where we, we went over a couple of tips, but we ran out of time because there was so much cool stuff to talk about. So I figured we would do a part two of this show and talk through some of the some of the rest of the, the bullet points that I put on the list. So guys, um, this is gonna be good. So you got the show notes? Are you ready to dive into this and, uh, and get going? That's right. All right, all right. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Lee Herbert, I'm gonna start with you. Just a little little bit about what you've what you've been up to in twenty nineteen and, and what's going on in your world. Um oh, okay. Uh a lot of planning. A lot of planning. So um <laughs> Nothing. I've, I've actually I've, I've already got April's fully booked. Um, so I will be at NAB at the beginning of April, um, working for a company who will be filming. So NAB is like a, a, a video conference convention kind of kind of thing. And so a couple of last year I worked for one company. This year I'm working for a different company mm -hmm. where they have a crew running around the show floor, interviewing people, looking at new stuff, and then they run the footage back to me in the media room, and I've got to edit those and have them uploaded by the end of the day. So that's what I'll be doing at NAB, which will be cool. Um, and then I get back to Melbourne for a week, and then I'm off to Jordan to film uh, content for a travel company, which should be heaps of fun. I haven't been to Jordan before, so I'm looking forward nice. to that. That's cool. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. Cool. Welcome back to the show again. And uh, Mr. Matt Granger, man, what about you? What, uh, what are you Hello. going to do? So, is it even the new year yet? My goodness, it Flies. Um, yeah, planning really as well. I just got my trip sorted. I'm, I've got a couple of days over to your coast uh, early next week, then heading to Copenhagen for a week. And I'm looking this way because my year planner is on the wall over there. Um, and then I've got the first two weeks of February in Peru. I'm going to cover uh, an annual festival that's going on there. Very cool. Busy, so it's busy. Been all good planning for today, working out flights and accommodation and all that good stuff. Good. Well, let, let's talk about some of that stuff. And, um, you know, it's a, the, the, the impetus of this show or for this show is you guys run the run around the world all the time, right? You're always talking to different or you're always talking to different people. You're leading workshops and training. And as a result, you probably have some historical knowledge built up about what to do and what not to do when you're on the road. So let, let's let's just dive into that. The, the first thing where we left the last show off is, was sort of the airline management piece of things and how you book, like this is, let's take it down to the, to the bone, right? So Matt, right now you're, you're about to book some travel. Mm -hmm. What do you do first? Do you, do you call the airline specific, you know, directly to their 1-800 number or do you, get on Expedia? Do you get on Travelocity.com? Do you have a travel agent on speed dial? How does that piece of your, your operations work? So first it'll be making sure that the job's confirmed and what's the, potent, the percentage chance that things are going to change, be canceled or extended so I know how flexible a ticket I need and how much uh, leeway I can build in for jet lag and that kind of thing. But if I take the, the last trip that I've booked, which was to go down to Peru, um, we searched flights uh, just via, I think I mentioned it last week, there's a, a last show called Hipmunk, a website that I like that uh, shows all the available flights in a uh, bar chart. So it shows flight layover, flight layover, and you see all of the time zones and everything. So it's quite easy to see how long the overall journey is. Um, that was a simple one, actually, because between New York and Lima, there's really only one direct flight and the rest are rebranded. And then I'll go and if I can, I'll book it directly with the airline on their website. If it's the same or within, say, 30 or 40 bucks of the price, I'll still book it with them instead of the booking website 
because if you do need to change something, there always seems to be extra catches, fees, headaches to change it through Expedia or one of those online sites compared to the, directly with the airline. Love it. And Lee, Lee what about you? Uh, Booking-wise, how do, how do you handle that stuff? Um, similar thing. So I will, as Matt said, you know, you want to make sure that uh, the, the money's in the bank, as it were. So um, I'll, I'll give you NAB actually as, as a good example. So with that, obviously, the client is covering my flights um, to a certain amount. Um, and then I will actually very often top that up a little bit to get myself on a slightly better ticket. Mm -hmm. um, or first of all, like for example, I don't do anything nice for myself on a daily basis. Like I don't have massages. I don't what have you is uh, my treat for myself is to give myself some nice seats when I travel because I travel so much. So if the client's willing to pay, normally it's at least premium economy or maybe a little bit under, a little bit over, I will then look at options to topping myself up um, on that flight to either put myself in premium economy or business. Um, so that's one thing that I look at when I'm sort of looking at flights. And then in terms of actually booking them, I've got very very much like Matt, I'll look at uh, Kayak, Skyscanner. Um, those two are quite good. Sky, Skyscanner I find is quite good for business class seats. They seem to have really good deals. Um, again, as Matt said, if you can book with the um, – with the actual airline. For NAB, for example, I haven't booked with the airline and that's because I looked at, at the airline and let's say they were about um, 36. Also, book as early as you can if you can mm -hmm. because I'll give you an example. So, so I'm looking Air New Zealand from here to Auckland, Auckland to LA, LA to Vegas. And when I looked at Air New Zealand's website a week ago, those flights were $3,600. And when I looked at the kayak and things like that, they were $2,900. And I was like, mm, that's, mm, that's, 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 you know, that's a fair amount. Of, that's a fair whack of change. So I waited a while because the, the gig hadn't been confirmed, confirmed. But then once it was confirmed, I went back to Air New Zealand's website and now they're $4,800. Jeez. Hmm. Yeah. And I went to my, travel agent who I normally deal with and said, Hey, look, can you guys do anything? And they came back and said, yeah, look, we can do 38, but then kayak was still 29. So guess who I booked the flights through? Yeah. 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 Well then that, that, that begs the question of, it seems like a Travelocity or an Expedia or one of those ilk of services is the path of least resistance, right? I mean, I know what you guys are saying about it. You know, there's all kinds of restrictions that are levied on you. If you go through a third party like that, but at what point do the, do, the, do the positives outweigh the negatives in terms of being able to just sit on your laptop in front of, you know, while you're Netflixing and chilling and saying, okay, I need to go to WPPI in February and make it happen. And I want to leave on this day and I want to come back on this date and they'll, you know, let that site handle your air travel, your hotel, your rental car if necessary, and all that stuff. Like, Matt, what, what would you say to that? Is that giving up too much control and, and, and the restrictions that go along with it? Or for some people, could that work? Yeah, sorry, did you have a point there, Lee? It seemed like you were... Uh... Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, I, just, I just wanted to make another point. Um, if you can, look at... If you're not locked into the days that you have to go, look at going a day earlier, a day later, or oh. leaving a day earlier, a day later. So, for example, with NAB, I'm actually arriving a day before I was supposed to, mm -hmm. and that's saving me about... $400 on the flight. Now, fair enough, the client's not going to pay for my accommodation for that one night, but I can find a $98 Airbnb by the airport and just chill out for a day. Yeah. And I'm saving three, four hundred dollars. Now, of course, if I needed to be there on that day and need to give you back on a certain day, you can't. But if you are flexible with your times, check the days that you need to. But if they seem like a little bit expensive, have a look at a day out either way. And sometimes there can be some serious savings because, you know, airlines will charge you more to fly on a Friday than they do on a Thursday or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and take that question about, you know, leaving the control up to one of these services, Lee, like, um, you know, like the, like the, you know, the Expedias or the Travelocities. It's like... I almost compare it to paying insurance. You know, nobody wants to pay insurance and you hope that you never need it. But, and also you sort of don't want to spend as much as possible on insurance. But if you cheap out on insurance, I find like I've heard horror stories of people who have cheaped out on insurance that when they need to make a claim, it becomes a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that old adage of you get what you pay for. So 
if nothing goes wrong and nothing changes within your schedule, you're probably going to be 100% fine with, with booking through one of these services. But as soon as something goes a little out of whack and you need to change something, there's an issue, most of the time you can fix it, but it's going to take three hours instead of half an hour to get it fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And we're all kind of small fries as well, you know, when you're booking things for yourself, all these companies are competing on sticker price of what's my Sydney to LA economy cost. And basic economy keeps getting more and more basic. So often when you're looking at flights, the the cheapest economy for a flight may be $600, but a fully flexible one might be $1,500. It's the same yeah. seat. It just means you can change it, reschedule it right up until the minute before it closes. Yeah. But if you're like... A, I don't know, you're working for for Rode, for example, I'm looking at your mic, or yeah. Apple, they'll have a corporate account where they get their economy or business seats at a flat rate and they're flexible. So that's the thing about getting it through a booking website. It might say it's a, a standard economy and that you get one check-in luggage and one carry-on, but there's so many classes of tickets. So a, mm. an economy, I don't even know any of them, and it's different for every airline, but there, there could be a class M and a class N the M has no change fee and the N is $600 change fee. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to get that information from the airline's own website. If the booking website tells you, then you can see, oh, okay, so the change fee is going to be 500 instead of 200 and the ticket's saving me 150 So do I think it's more than a 50-50 chance that I'm going to need to change my ticket and you can roll the dice? Um, what Lee said, if you've got the flexibility or the time, do it early and be flexible. But occasionally, if you get a job that's, we need you there in three days, you just have to, you, you know, if the job's good enough, you got to pay through the nose for the ticket and go do it. You know, all those, hopefully all those... when it's... Oh, go ahead, Lee. Go when, ahead, Lee. when they need you in three... I was going to say, hopefully when they say they need you in three days, they're going to pay through the nose and not you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, you know, with all of this discussion, you know, this part of the chat about airline booking and all that, is the is the career field or the profession of travel agent dead now? Is it just gone because we have the internet and we can all, we can take control over that and do it ourselves? And what, what, you guys are shaking your head. What do you think? I rarely use them, but no, the, especially in some places you need it. Also as a fixer. So, for yeah. example, going in and out of Lima, fine. But then I've got a woman there, uh, that sounds dodgy, but I've got a lady who I use her services a lot who I'll just email her and she'll organize all the transfers to and from the airport, the domestic flights. She can get better seats, better prices than I can on the LAN websites. And again, transfers, you're landing in a dusty airport where I wouldn't. there's not even like a local taxi that's going to be waiting there that having someone who can just do all that and then I meet her at the airport, hand her the cash and it's all so affordable and I'm sure it's marked up 100% for her time and service, but just knowing that there's someone local there who the day before I'm going is calling all these people to make sure everything's still in place, you know, that's – I can't do that myself. Yeah. yeah I'll, 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 I'll give you a perfect example. So the, the company that I'm going to Jordan with, um, they're the same company that I worked for in Ecuador last year and in Canada the year before. And, and when I got – when I landed in Ecuador, I've been traveling for about 36, 38 hours. I land – we landed like 1 o'clock in the morning. It took me 45 minutes to get through immigration, another 45 minutes to get the customs. I put my bags through the X-ray machine and they give me those – okay, you need to go to the special search. I'm like, oh, God, oh, God. oh sweet, please no. And, 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 and suddenly I'm panicking. I'm like, oh, what, what have I done? And there's only about 10 people in front of me, but it's taking them like 30 minutes to search each person because they're going through everyone's bags, like item by item. Why do you have this? Why do you have this? I'm like, oh, wow, what am I going to And I'm turning up with like some serious gear. And I, the thing was, because I was going with this, this company, they had someone waiting at the airport for me, and when I didn't come out, they were able to come in and find me and say, hey, are you okay? Is there anything fine? They worked as a translator. When I actually got to the thing of being searched, you know, they opened up I opened up the bag with the clothes, like, no, no, we're not interested. I opened up the bag with the tripods and the lights and everything. They're like, okay, explain. I said, mm -hmm. well, I'm a filmmaker. And they say to me, have you got proof of being a filmmaker? And I go, well, I've got my business card. They went, oh, yeah, good enough. Off you go. Oh, because all the all the gear wasn't enough proof of you being a filmmaker. <laughs> but, 
Well, I, I, yeah, think, I think it was the, the twenty thousand dollars worth of stuff in that one bag. It doesn't do it, but this little this little uh, card will do it, right? Hey, look, they said I could go. I wasn't going to ask why. Yeah. Um, but because I was on an arranged thing, you know that 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 local guy came in. He acted as a translator. As soon as he showed up and said, "Hey, I, I'm I'm here from from the company. I'm here to help you," my stress levels just dropped from like ninety to twenty percent. Yeah, mm. you know, and so that is where going with someone trusted and organized and not sort of trying to do everything yourself can really make a difference. Well, how do you, how do you find those feet on the street? How do you get to get to a local person in a location that you haven't been before and and a trusted person because you don't want to, you know, find find somebody who's going to take advantage of you because you're trusting this person. How, how do you find a trusted resource in the local country to help you out? You want to take a minute? Well, uh, well for me in the past it's been a uh, personal reference. So if someone has worked with them before, then that's the absolute best. So if someone says, I went to Cuba, I dealt with this person, they were fantastic, here's their email, that's generally good enough. Um, but it, it can seem, I get it, everyone, like Lee said, you're exhausted and you're a little bit on edge when you're in a place you've never been before and you don't know what the local scam or angle may be. But going to any country at any part of the world, if you find an established business that's been around 10 or 20 years who is doing this kind of thing, they know what they're doing. And yeah. if they have a real business that you can suss out beyond just, you know, one page website, it's not in their interest to screw people over. You'll pay a premium. I guess that's the other thing. If it's way too cheap to be reasonable for the amount of time it's going to require them to help you out, then that's maybe a bit of an alarm bell. But yeah, generally it's, someone told you they've worked with them before. Well, if you were going to do, if you were looking for someone like that in the U.S., my knee-jerk reaction from pretty much any service like that, you know, like a restaurant or whatever, would be um, Yelp reviews. Is there such a thing? I, I don't even know. If, is Yelp international for those sorts of things where you can see ratings for, for tourism com companies or guides or travel agents? Um, I can. And I, another one is TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. That would do it. So, what about flight insurance, guys? So, you know, Lee, when you're when you're getting ready to travel, you're in particular, you know, I know Matt, you travel a lot of stuff too, but Lee, you're a filmmaker. So, yeah. filmmaker, you could take photographer and you know X fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of the stuff, it's gotten smaller over the last decade, but you still have to carry a lot of stuff. Um, how do you how do you safeguard that stuff? You know, both in terms of making sure it gets to its final destination and then also with your flight, are you looking at flight insurance? You know, you know how they tr try to tell you, sell you the flight insurance. Do you do that? Like, how do you safeguard yourself? So, again, I'm lucky because I've worked for this travel company for the last three years. Um, they, you know, we've got, I've got a relationship with them. So in terms of travel insurance, I always get travel insurance with them. In fact, this year I'm going to be traveling so much that – um, and, and it's worth asking about this. There's actually an option to get 12 months worth of travel insurance. Wow. So instead of just buying travel insurance for your trip, obviously it's going to cost more, but if you're going to be, tra if you're going to be doing, you know, four international, even just four international trips a year, it's worth looking at just getting travel insurance for the whole year. Now, the thing is that covers you not for any of your gear. Maybe if, you know, if you're just traveling with a couple of cameras, a couple of lenses, you're all right. But if you're traveling professionally, it won't cover you for your gear. What it covers you is flight cancellations, health issues. If you hurt yourself, um, you need a hotel for an extra night, things like that. And that, again, is well worth it. Uh, for gear, again, I'm lucky that the, the gear insurance that I pay, which is not cheap, but it covers me internationally as well. So I just you know email my insurance broker, every two or three months and go, Hey, look, this is where I'm going to be. And these are the dates for the next three months. Have I got any issues? And it's always, no, no, you're fine. This, you know, your, your policy covers you. So, yeah. and thankfully I'm finding some wood to touch. I've never had to make a claim. So, yeah. so that point of view, in terms of when you're actually traveling, how do you kind of try and safeguard your stuff? Um, I will always, and I'm sure you know, I've heard a lot of people say this. I will always make sure that I have enough gear in my carry on to do the job. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we've talked about that is you, yeah. you have to assume that you're never going to see that gear again when you hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And then be pleasantly surprised when it pops out on the mm. conveyor belt. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, uh, Matt, I want to talk to you about that as well. So both of you guys travel to relatively exotic locations and on the, you know, continuing on the insurance sort of tangent. I would worry that one of my personal worries would be if I'm traveling to a location where I, I don't have, let's say, the white blood cell antibodies built up for yet, right? Mm -hmm. And they invade, you know, right? I, I, you know, you want to make sure that you're taken care of and there's your, your home doctor and Kaiser or whatever you're using is here back in the U.S. How do you manage that? And have you gotten sick on a trip where you've had to use local resources to get help mm -hmm. again? So just back on the, the general worldwide insurance thing, yeah. I, I, it's not just an American thing. Often anyone thinks outside my country is exotic and a little bit more dangerous. Yeah. But when you're looking at worldwide insurance, it doubles when you include America. Really? <laughs> it should. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's the primo one. Yeah. And as an Australian, I've known in the past that if I broke my leg in the States, they would probably fly me back with a nurse with a broken leg to get treated in Australia than they would treat me in America. Wow. Because wow. it's cheaper. That, and to, I don't know if it's the quality of care as well, but yeah, definitely cheaper. Yeah. So, uh for my insurance, when I was living in Australia, I likewise had gear, worldwide insurance, um, and then would have a separate annual policy. In the States, there's a, a site called insuremytrip.com that a lot of our guests use that'll do one-off or multiple trip insurance, and they seem they have good evacuation and medical coverage as well. Um, have I... Yeah, I've, I mean, I've gotten sick, but nothing where I've had to be hospitalized or broken bones or anything that I needed to make a, a health claim that I can think of. Um, I mean, technically, I living in America now is I'm traveling. So yeah. if I had health issues here, then that would be it. But, um, you know, again, if you're on the road in a tent by yourself, that's one thing. But if you're there with a company, then they'll probably try to get you to the the best doctor in town. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Well, that's good. Knock on wood, man, that you haven't had any calamity while you're you're on the road. Yes. Um, so let's switch gears and talk a little bit about points, right? So you guys are frequent flyers, and I know some people that live, like the, the world of points and airline mm -hmm. travel points and hotel points, and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's like an iceberg, and once you discover the tip of it and you look down, it just people are living on points, and everything they do somehow relates to points. You know, I'm going to order a pizza. Are there any points involved with that? You know? It's like, are you guys, Lee, are you in that world where you are tracking every single point and you live, you live in a point world, or is it just, ah, I made some points on that last flight. I'll check it later. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering points person. Um, <laughs> When um when, when I lived in New Zealand, I was traveling uh, three weeks three weeks out of every five weeks I was on the road, um so I was I was racking up the points and, and at the t at the time when I first met my my wife uh, she was living in Toronto and I was living in Auckland New Zealand so I was sort of back and forth thing so actually a week before I was going to visit her in Toronto so that I could use the lounges on all the international airports I flew to Christchurch for lunch just to get the points. That, yeah, you might need an intervention. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm much better now. Uh, I can stop anytime I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My bank manager told me to. Yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, so one thing I was going to say uh, with points, uh, particularly with airline points, is you need to be aware of this. With some airlines, there's a difference between air points and status points. Mm hmm and very often, like, so for example, using a business card, hotels, things like that, that will very often get you air points, which is great because those you can use towards flights and things like that. But status points, generally, you're only going to get those for flying on the airline and on their planes. Um, you will sometimes get status points flying with that airline's flight number, but on a different aircraft, so like a co-chair sort of agreement, mm -hmm. but you don't get as many status points. And the status points, at least from a flying point of view, are what you want. Because once you get to a certain status, that's where you get 
an extra check bag for every flight. You get access to the lounges, which, oh, the lounges are just the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, you get, you know, priority boarding. And like Matt was saying on the previous show, when you use the priority line to board, they're going to, they're less likely to look at the weight of your carry on and things like that. Yeah. So it's definitely worth getting the status and, and, and getting to that point of status. And then you get, um, you get upgrades as well, right? So, you know, from, yeah, which from is whatever also class nice. to a next class up or, you know, yeah. Yeah. Lee, yeah the, you, you know, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. The, just the points in America is a big deal. I've found that it's, you know, you have, they're so formal about the boarding groups. It's not like in other places where it's gold members and business, then premium economy and silver, and then everyone, there'll be nine boarding groups for a domestic flight. And once the overhead fills up, which if it's a full flight is often, <clears throat> you know, you could be a gold member, but you're in group five, they're, they're gate checking everyone's carry on. Yeah. So being in group one or two, even if you're not in a premium seat, even dot, 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 you'll at least get your bag into an overhead bin and not gate checked, which is a big one. I saw an interesting thing in Australia, it was years ago, and I don't know that it really holds anymore, but they did this big comparison showing if you went for the miles and this and that, this was just about buying airline tickets and staying within your network and all of that kind of thing, or just took the cheapest ticket that was available over a long term, you were better off to just get the best ticket, like financially, Forgetting, so you you get points. You can get a free flight here. You can get an upgrade there. What was that worth? Comparing it to just buying the tickets at the best rate on whichever airline. Financially, you're better off that way. So if you're a light flyer, that's probably the way to do it. It's once you're flying a lot and you value that extra comfort, and you're looking at how can I get an upgrade, or I'm guessing Lee's and you too, Frederick, are the same that. You fly a lot for work and then you have a, a family trip once a year. Then you've got the points to just take the family trip for free because you've gotten those points from, you know, business yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, it, and it pays to just sort of be cognizant of that, right? A little bit of planning at the beginning of the year or whenever so that as you're walking through the, or as you're making your travel arrangements with an eye towards, hey, we're going to you know, go to Disneyland in December or whatever, then you know you, you yeah. plan it. Little planning goes a long way, especially with with points. So I want to. And I've got. Oh, I'm go ahead, just, Lee, just go. on just on points. I've got I've got three good websites to check out for points. Um, the first one is a US one that I follow, which is really annoying because they have like really good deals. I'm like, okay, it's US only, so that doesn't help me. Um, is the Points Guy? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the Points .com, So they're they're. It's a dangerous rat hole to get into because once you start there, you're like you 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 get sunk in very deep. Um, another one to look at is wheretocredit.com, um, and what that does is if you are flying on an airline that's out of your network, you may still be able to get some points towards your network regardless because. I won't bore you with the detail, but like I'm, I'm to, to Jordan, I might be flying with Oman Air, but you can credit those points to Etihad and then you can credit Etihad to Air New Zealand and I don't think it's going to work, but it's worth a try. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, and then the other one, once you've got status, is a website called Status Matcher, which sometimes what you can do is mm -hmm. if you've got status on one network – you can contact another network and say, hey, I'm going to be flying sort of two or three flights with you guys this year. Are you willing to match my status on the one that I've got? Now, most of them say no, but sometimes you get lucky and it's it's the price of an email. So that's also worth looking into. That's cool. And he thinks that he's recovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You see that? I used to be much God. worse. <laughs> there used to be ten resources. Now there are only three. <laughs> That's cool. All right, guys, let, let's talk about loadout a little bit. Um, you know, like like we mentioned, Lee, you're you're a filmmaker, so you've got you know Sherpas and donkeys and everything carrying oh. your stuff around. Uh, Matt's not so much, but still a lot of stuff. Looking, looking at the current state of technology, you know, if we're looking at, say, uh, smartphones and, you know, mirrorless cameras and you know, like the Osmo thing I was showing you guys before we started recording the Osmo Pocket, these things are getting smaller. How has that, Matt, I'll, I'll kick it off with you. How, how has that changed your loadout in terms of things you bring to any given gig? Uh, 
you know, I don't know that it's overall reduced my luggage. It's probably changed what I take. Like five years ago, I wouldn't have thought of taking along a drone. And now it's not a difficult thing to take along. Um, I, in terms of my camera gear, what I'm using hasn't changed terribly much for my own work in the past five years, to be honest. But when I'm often taking things to test along on the road, then it could be a nice little mirrorless kit or it could be 600 mil lenses, which are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the biggest thing would be, you know, I use my phone for so many things now on the road that I, uh, well, maybe the, the one big saving has been the size and weight of my laptop has probably halved over the last five years. That's mm -hmm. a big thing. And yeah. I can pretty much do all the work I need just on a high, I mean, it, it is an expensive high spec laptop, but it's still easy to carry around all day. I wouldn't even notice if I took it or didn't take it. So that's, that's a big one for me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. The, the, the weight and size of things really, really, I mean, you, 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 sometimes you take it for granted, but when you look at like when you're getting ready to go and which bag to take and what bag not to take and what to put in what and chargers and all that stuff, it adds up and it can literally cost you money when you look at weight and that sort of thing. Matt, I guess that, Sorry to interrupt, but I get no, that. Yeah, well, it was in the back of my mind. I didn't get it out. That mm -hmm. that's the thing. Actually, the things that add up is the power strips, the batteries, the chargers, the tripods, the monitors, the cables, and that stuff hasn't changed. Yeah. So, you know, my video or stills tripods are still four or two pounds, and my power strip is still the same. So, if I downsized my you know, full-size DSLR to a mirrorless and some slightly smaller lenses, that reduces my camera kit by half, but it only reduces my overall kit by 10%. Yeah. Because yeah. it's all the other stuff that is really bogging me down personally. No, Matt, are you, are you bringing the, the same kit to every gig that you do? I mean, you just, you know, you work out of that or do you kind of examine what your mission is on that particular trip and then build your loadout based on that? Yeah, definitely the latter. So uh, some trips it will be triple others. You know, sometimes I need two giant check-ins that are right on the edge and then a ridiculously over-the-top carry-on as well or two. Um, and sometimes I can get away with just a carry-on. So, yeah, it completely varies. Um, but it will generally be one or two video cameras, one or two stools cameras, and then whatever stuff to go around that I need, depending on what needs to be delivered. Yeah, yeah just the, the food package for all those cameras, right? <laughs> what they need yeah. to survive. Lee, what about you? Are you the same? Do you, you have a standard loadout or do you, you, you build based on the mission at hand? Absolutely build based on the mission at hand. And, and I'm always looking to try and sort of whittle it down. Um, to give you an example, my main camera at the moment is the Sony FS5, which when you break it down is tiny and ridiculously light. Mm -hmm. um, but as Matt was saying, once you start adding stuff to it, like if I, I can actually shoot ProRes RAW out of that with an Atomos Shogun. But the problem is the Atomos Shogun is about the size of the camera. So, for example, when I was in Israel in December, I was shooting stuff for this documentary I'm working on, and everything I've shot for the documentary so far has all been in ProRes RAW, but I had the choice of, well, do I want to schlep everything all the way to Israel with me, or can I get away with just shooting internally on the camera? And I decided just to leave the monitors at home and just record internally on the camera. Yeah. because, And then I thought, right, well, do I take my gimbal with me, or... Instead, do I take you know the, the gimbal for my for my bigger cameras, or instead, you know, if, if you actually stop and think about what camera you're using for what footage, you can you, you you'll be surprised what you can in inverted commas get away with. So, for example, in Israel, what I did was I've been using the um, the moment lenses for my phone for a while now and they're, they're they're the pricier end of the phone lenses but the quality is gorgeous um and i got a friend of mine to lend me his little iphone movi gimbal jobby um which is a great bit of git and i took that and the lenses and for the b-roll where i did need a gimbal shot i just used my phone yeah. and yeah you know what it's not going to be the quality that i would have gotten out of my bigger cameras but I made sure that I used it, you know, in the light, in, in the correct lighting conditions and all that kind of stuff. 
and the footage looks great. Yeah. So I, I'm definitely I'm I'm one of the worst in terms of I want the best quality. So I want to take the biggest and the fanciest and most you know highest end kind of stuff I can. But even I'm kind of going. You know what? Sometimes the quality you get out of the smaller and lighter stuff is going to be absolutely fine. Yeah. And I, that, that, that begs the question though, you know, as time changes that statement that you made the, you know, the biggest, most expensive stuff generally generates the highest quality. You know, if you take what's in each of your smartphones right now, put it in a time machine and go back 20 years, 15 years, that's, magic and heresy you'd be burned at the stake right <laughs> for, for yeah, also, if, such if, amazing if quality. yeah if, if i if i went back 20 or 30 years i'd be getting paid four times as much yeah so. that's true that's true i mean but the, the point is <laughs> with that with that with the i mean the point i'm trying to make is like with, with the cell phone technology or smartphone technology where it is and the quality 4k that you can get out of these cameras have you have both of you guys have you shifted your mindset over to you know what I could I could do part of this gig with just my phone, or are you like, well, yeah, there's, it's heresy. Phones are phones. That's a smartphone. That's for entertainment and consumption. And my real gear is for real stuff. Who wants to take that first? Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in yeah. the middle. Yeah, I wouldn't want to rely on it, but it's yeah. there's definitely same that if the shot works, it works. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you sometimes an aerial shot works, sometimes an underwater shot, and this in a bag in a well-lit pool might actually deliver perfect quality for the three-second cutaway that we need. Yeah. Why am I going to build out a $10,000 rig that cost me $500 to rent for the day when we only need 10 seconds of B-roll? That's right. It's ridiculous. It, it also depends where it's going to go. And to be honest, a lot of my stuff ends up online and by the time like on youtube and by the time it's there it's so compressed mm. i would you'd have to be an expert in sometimes to know was it a gh5 an fs5 a cinema camera or you know uh, your little osmo yeah 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 and that and that's the point if 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 no one knows then you know yeah. you know who what? cares one thing to think about, though, with the smaller cameras, and this is something that I found out trying to use my phone for for more, in inverted commas, serious stuff, um, it'll overheat. And so, like, if I was trying to shoot an interview, I'd get maybe five, ten minutes. Because if you're trying to shoot five to ten solid minutes of 4K, 60 frames per second off of a phone, odds are within five minutes or less, that phone's going to go, nah. I'm I'm done. Um, it actually like it, it shuts down. It goes. I'm overheated. I uh, switch me. Ch try me again in ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that's that's where the line is. A lot of times between pro gear and consumer yeah. grade gear, reliability, is, is reliability, yeah. and just being able to get the job done and not having to make excuses to the client. Like, oh, my phone overheated. <laughs> and that, yeah. that's actually, I think, an important point because you want to keep the show accessible and not discourage people from going and doing this stuff. And you can use basic stuff, but going from a $500 phone to a $1,500 camera to a $5,000 camera to a $20,000 camera, it's not that the image quality is trebling each time. Mm. It is getting incrementally better and you can't get on a phone or a, you know, a DSLR what you can from a cinema camera. You just can't, no matter what people may think you can't, mm -hmm. but it's more that you can build it out, that it won't overheat, that it's bulletproof, that it's, got 10 different formats that the other cameras, you know, have never even thought about. You can do more with the footage and the experience of using it. You know, if you're grabbing five seconds of B-roll, that's one thing. But if Lee's walking around Petra for a day, you want the right gear that's actually not going to break your back. And, you know, the rig he uses to carry his camera might cost more than some cameras. Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's being able, it's, it's the ability to, to have to make fewer compromises, right? The, the more yeah. pro and professional and, you know, to some degree expensive the gear, the less compromises your compromises you have to make, which I found, I, I found that a long time ago when I was, um, uh, man, it was like 10 years ago, I was dabbling in 3D and trying to learn 
Maya. Remember that? Remember Maya mm-hmm. and trying to learn mm-hmm. those apps? I quickly learned that I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it, Maya was one of those apps that was just ridiculously expensive and you had to get a license and I had a hardware dongle key and all this stuff to get to it. But when you get in the app to do stuff, to build entire worlds was relatively simple where you could do something similar and say After Effects or something like that, but it would take you 50 years to do it. Whereas in Maya, you're like, yeah, the gravity is this strong and the wind is blowing from that direction and drop a ball and the ball would bounce and roll in the direction of the wind flow, right? Whereas you'd have to animate all that in other applications. Um, but that, yeah, that makes sense. So, so Matt, I, you know, speaking of the whole idea of expensive gear, right? Mm-hmm. You, everything you guys do is expensive, from the travel to the gear to your well, your, your invoices. Yeah, yeah, expensive <laughs> is a relative term, right? It's you know, yeah, everything is. But but when you when you're at a location, let's let's pick a you know, on a scale of one to ten, it's let's say a six on the dangerous scale in terms of you you know you're going to get robbed or or otherwise accosted or whatever in Brooklyn there you go <laughs> Brooklyn right so you're but you're in a hotel in Brooklyn and your gear is there and you want to go out to dinner with Matt you want to go out to dinner with the models you were shooting in Times Square that night what do you do like do you how do you secure that gear do you just pray that it's going to be there when you get back or you know, or if you go out for the day shooting the next morning, you're not going to take everything you slept to Brooklyn with you, assuming you're not from Brooklyn. Um, you're not going to take everything with you when it's in the room. How do you make sure it's going to be there when you get back? So my most of my bags do lock. It's it's just the deterrent. If someone wants to steal something, they're going to. And yeah. the number of times I reckon a quarter of hotel safes aren't bolted to the freaking cupboard. You know, you lock the door and you can just pick the safe up and walk out. I I take photos of it every time I find it. You pull the drawer open and you can just rip the safe out with two fingers. But it's a deterrent and it's an extra step and the cleaning staff will be noticed if they're walking down the hallway with the safe under their arm. Um, So I, I just lock it. I have, I'll put it out of sight. I don't travel with fancy looking, you know, if... I heard from someone that Remoa and the Samsonite, some fancy Vogue edition, they're the, by far the most stolen luggage because everyone knows you've got a $2,000 luggage, then you must have something nice inside it yeah. as well. Right. So I tend to go for things that have uh, that are well-built, that don't look too flashy. Um, I, one big one is so often you get into the hotel, you unlock your luggage, you open it up, and then whether you're locking it or not, your combination is then left sitting on the unlock combination. So if the clean, uh, I mean, it hasn't happened to me. My, one of my parents did get robbed in Hawaii of all places once that the jewelry that was in the luggage disappeared. Um, the only thing they could think was that they left it unlocked on the combination when the cleaner came in and they were there and they noticed the combination and took a oh, mental note of it, you know, so yeah. when they came back, they knew the combination to unlock it. But, um, I don't have some earth-shatteringly smart way to keep yourself stuff up, your stuff safe other than locking it. And if you were having to travel with cash or small, really valuable things to uh, put them in the actual hotel safe rather than the room safe. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, but for the most part, I think a lot of a lot of crimes like that are crimes of they're spontaneous crimes of opportunity. So, like you say, if you if you're locking, if you have a bunch of stuff in your room don't leave your laptop out on the desk in the room and all your camera gear strewn about, put it in a Which luggage is, and lock it that's down. That's actually hard because so often when you finally so get to go out to dinner, you need the, cut, the the computer running to be backing up or rendering or whatever. Yeah. So <clears throat> leaving five bucks on the pillow is a much nicer way than and an easier target than, you know, looking for your passport that's hidden in a drawer or something. So, you know, a couple of bucks for the cleaning lady probably is a good insurance policy, That's too. That's not a bad idea. I never thought about that. Huh. Lee, do you do that? Do you leave uh, you leave a bribe on the bed before you take off for dinner? A tip, no, not a bribe. No, no, I, um, I hide my things in my dirty underwear. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Unless, unless the thief likes dirty underwear, you're good. <laughs> if, 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 if they've pulled it out, they've earned it. <laughs> And in that case, they're probably not there for the hard drive that you had hidden in the two-day-old drawers. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Uh, only Lee Herbert, ladies and gentlemen. Only <laughs> Lee. He yeah, only admits to it. I've done that. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, guys. Um, uh, after this, this next, I want to talk about backing up before we jump into the picks of the week, but be prepared. I'm going to hit you both with what your picks of the week are for this week in photo. Lee, uh, I'm going to start with you on purpose because you have more data, presumably, because you're shooting 4K, 90p, 300p video on Sony cameras, and you got a lot of stuff. Do you, do you, when you get back on the plane, are you just like, you know, I hope it's going to be okay. I'm going to hope it's going to be okay. Or, well, or, or do you take precautions and what are they? So I have, um, I've normally got at least three or four hard drives with me when I'm traveling. Um, and that's not for multiple things. That's there's, the, so I've got three or four copies of everything. So, you know, I've got my solid state drives, which are, you know, little Samsung's, little Atoms. Um, I just got this new Glyph, which is pretty cool. Nice. Like four terabyte solid state. Jeez. Um, so I've got that, and then I'll have um, bigger drives, uh, like five terabyte, six terabyte drives. Uh, but they're still the little portable ones. So I'll have one fast one that is my edit one, and then I'll have at least two others, which are my backups of my edit. And when I'm traveling, each one will be in a separate bag. So one will be in my one carry-on, the other one will be in my other carry-on, and one will be in the checked-in bag. So that, fingers crossed, I've, I've, it's not perfect, but it's the best I can do. And, and, yeah. and but you're not, you're thank, not, you're not trying to push anything up to the cloud or anything while you're out there. Most of the places that I go don't have the kind of upload speeds to upload, you know three terabytes worth of stuff in yeah. three days yeah. so yeah. it's just it's, it's just not gonna happen. like in the old days what i used to do is I, I would actually um i'd get one of those rugged lussy ones and i would mail that to myself oh. um which again if you're if you're desperate like you could just mail uh, an sd card to yourself which is another thing that you could do mm-hmm. um but i just found like it eh, i just couldn't be i just can't be bothered anymore so i just have three copies of everything and, and separate them out and Thankfully, I've never had an issue. Yeah, it to makes date. perfect sense in separa- separating it out. What, what about you, Mag Ranger? How are, how are you handling the trip back? The trip back to make sure your data gets back to exactly the same. So I'll, I normally it'll be maximum three. So I have SSDs that I'll have. Uh, I've got a the like, rugged Lassi drive for yep. an extra one, uh, more space but slow. Which so normally I'll back up to one, back up to the other, and then hopefully every other day, put all of that onto this guy. But then the the only other thing is I make sure that I'm cycling through my media, that they don't have an infinite life. So I've lost more data from corrupt or failed cards than I have mm. drives in the last five years. Probably all the 20 years before that, it was when drives died. Wow. But now that I have a good backup system, it doesn't take much, right? If you If one card gets just reaches end of life and it has a hundred gig of footage from the day that you haven't got to the hotel to back up. Well, you SOL. So, you know, when I find I, I'm really finicky about it now, if I have a one disc, you know, get corrupted and need to be reformatted, I will just put that to the side and only use that as a backup card and cycle in new cards, especially if it's a couple of years old. So you're not, are you, do you, like how anal about that are you? Like when you when you get a new SD card or CF card or whatever, do you mark that date and then say, hey, in X, you know, in in a year and a half, I'm going to toss that one and, and replace it, or do you wait for a corruption to happen? That's that's actually I'm not quite that anal, but you, I can normally tell, and you know, I go through phases. So the fact that this one is from a company that's now defunct, that's a sign. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, yeah. And then I've got older ones where the labels just about worn off, so they're now out of rotation. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I can track how old the cards are by the speed of the card because you know what right. speed they're up to these days. So uh, unfortunately. A lot of my gear is running XQD and they're just on hold now other than the Sony ones. So it's going to come to a point where I have to replace two terabytes of XQD cards because they're they're getting to end of life soon. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Another really great bit of gear that you can use for when you're traveling to protect your gear is a label maker. Mm. I print out... I print out my email address, the smaller size I can, and put it on everything including my SD cards. Wow. So that, that way, if someone honest does find it, they can email it to me and send it back. 
Okay. And is it do you are is all are all your bags labeled, I'm assuming, right? Everything has your all all my bags are like well well, I mean all my bags have got a business card thingy in it, which right. you know, so so it's got that. Um and then yeah, all my gear, like even my cameras, everything has got my email address labeled on them somewhere. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Well, good. Excellent, excellent tips, gentlemen. Um, we are at the end of that travel tip segment, so perfect. Can we close that off with a nice little bow? Thank you for it, for that. Um, let's jump into the Picks of the Week segment. So the Picks of the Week segment is when you guys get to recommend something that is related to photography. Could be a training course, could be a plug-in, could just be a mindset for 2019 for photographers to use going forward um, to help them with their photography. Matt Granger, uh, let's start with you. What is your pick of the week, man? Well, that was perfect scheduling. It follows on directly from what we were just talking about. I have to say I've not gotten hands-on with one of these yet, but I have heard from people they're great, and I'm going to get one in. Um, the guy When Lexa fell to pieces, the, a lot of the execs left and made this company ProGrade that a lot of people are using now, and they've just released these new uh, runs of uh, USB 3.1 using the C-type interface, yeah. and it's a dual UHS-2 reader that you can get uh, simultaneous data transfer that's like three times faster than any other plug-in SD card reader I've yeah. seen. And you yeah. can get it on two channels. So if you're using something like a, a MacBook Pro or something similar with a fast SSD, you can be dropping two cameras worth of data at once faster than the cards can currently transfer. So it, it's they say 1250 megabyte per second dual channel. Yeah, yeah, I second that emotion. I'm a I'm a pro grade fan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the reader and the and, and some of the cards and yeah, that's a whole nother discussion we need to have. <laughs> oh, nice, um, Lee. What about you, man? Um, what's uh what is your pick of the week for this episode? So my pick has been a long time coming. I backed this on Indiegogo over two years ago, uh -huh. and, and it just showed up um, yesterday, right? <laughs> it, it did. Yeah, it, it showed up a week ago. So you know what? It showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was Better joking, and, and you were like serious. See, That's no, it. no, it, it seriously, it took them two years. Like it was supposed, I was expecting to have these for my trip to Canada, which was May two thousand seventeen, and it was delayed and delayed and delayed, delayed. And you know, they sent out the email going, "Oh, we care," and all. I'm like, "Yeah, right, whatever." But hey, it turned up. So what it is is the Loom Cube Air. Oh, nice. Um, so a very nice little light um, to. Put it in perspective. Here is the old Loom Cube. So, okay, so it's about uh, it's got it lost about a third of its weight. Looks like yep, yeah, third of its weight, third of its size. One of my favorite things is the Why back did of it. That take two years. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, not going to ask. One of the best things is the back of it is magnetic, okay. so you can just attach it to metal things, which is cool. For the size of the light, it's ridiculously bright. It's waterproof to thirty feet. Um, it will work as a constant light. So I actually, the, the, the originals, I use them a lot um, to actually um, light the background of a lot of my scenes. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I, when I was in Israel, I was shooting these interviews and the background was a bit plain and there was a bowl of fruit on the table. So I just put one behind the bowl of fruit and just backlit the bowl of fruit. And suddenly the background was a lot more dramatic than just a bowl of fruit. Yeah. Um, you can also hook them up via Bluetooth to your phone, and your phone's camera will trigger the flash, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it's 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 not ridiculous. It's not overly cheap. I think they're about seventy dollars each, mm -hmm. um, so a fair chunk of change. But even though it took two years to turn up, I'm I'm pretty impressed. And how do you how do you charge life that compare thing? between the two? Very so, pardon. No, go ahead. Go Sorry. ahead, Matt. Sorry to speak over you. I was just wondering, with the size and weight reduction, how's the battery life between the two compared? Seems exactly the same. You'll get about an hour out of them. If they're a full blast, you'll get probably about half an hour. Um, very good question about charging them. That's also one of the really nice differences. The old one had this sort of screw thing on at the back, and you had to unscrew it, and there was a pain in the tush, and there was USB at the back. The new ones have just got this section here, which just has a, has a clip. So you just push the clip down, and... Hey, presto, you can just Aww. pop it in it. It's micro USB. Oh, so, micro. So I, don't I was hoping you were going to say USB-C. 
Yeah, well, USB-C wasn't around two years ago. Right, <laughs> right. See? <laughs> They're kickstartering that one next. That's, that'll be, what is that, uh, 2021 launch? Uh, if, 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 may, may I live long enough to see it? <laughs> There's always something to stretch for. Um, yeah, no, USB-C would be nice, but uh, look, you know, like, I waited two years for it. I'm just thankful it arrived. It arrived. Yeah, see that? I love these, I love these Kickstarter projects and, and you know, or, or Indiegogo. But that's the thing, you know. It's the it's the when is it going to ship thing, and I'm a I, you know, Amazon Prime has me conditioned to want it today or tomorrow. <laughs> so. Well, also, it, will it ever ship? So, I mean, right. that's that's the other thing because I know you've said it many times. Like I like I generally won't back anything that's more than two or three hundred dollars because I can't afford to gamble more than two or three hundred dollars, and that is. Let's be honest. You you are gambling the money because yeah. there's never a guarantee that it'll turn up. So, sure. but buyer beware, absolutely, absolutely. But with this on their website, it does exist. You can order it; it will turn up. It's not an Indiegogo thing. Right. It's, it's right. on their website. I may order a couple of those because I could I could definitely use a couple of those. Um, yeah. Well, cool guys. Those are those are two great picks: ProGrade Digital and the Loom Cube. What was it called? The Loom Cube Air, Air right? Loom. Loom Cube Air. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Magnetic. The magnetic thing is pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Cool. All what's, right. What's your pick? Um, you don't I, pick my <laughs> okay. So I do have a pick. Uh, my pick is a training course. So if you or actually a training site. So on this week in photo, I've had the folks from RGG Edu on before. They do a training site, which is is really really cool. And they just released their. I think they're pre-selling a course right now on uh, real estate photography. And the, the cool thing about the courses that RGG EDU does is that they're, they're kind of, it's hard to put into to words. So where traditional online training is, is typically talking head like me in front of the camera. Hi, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. Today I'm going to teach you how to, and then go to screencast. I teach you something and then back to me. What those guys do is they take more of a documentary photography style approach to things and and apply it to different genres of photography in this latest case and this one that they're they're pre-selling now it's real estate so and and the reason i wanted to bring it up on this show is that um we did i interviewed a couple of real estate photographers and an architectural photographer and the response was crazy in terms of how many people loved it and wanted to see more content like that so you know, if that's any indication of the demand that's in that particular market or genre, then the, the course that they're launching will do pretty well. And you can check it out. Just go over to rggedu.com and, uh, you know, you'll see it. I think they have a trailer up and everything for it right now. So it's pretty good stuff. Cool. All right, cool. gents. We are at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Uh, this is the first time both of you have been on in 2019. No, second time. Was it first time? Did we do the last one in 2018? It's that only a year been ago, a I week. It's only been a, no two weeks. It's been two weeks. It's been two weeks. I mean, this year has only been around a week. Right, right. Yeah, I haven't done anything this year. That's right. It's only the tenth as we record this. I know. Yeah, blink and it'll be May. Well, mark my words. <laughs> it's already tomorrow for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're you're always living in the future, man. You're ahead of the ahead of your game. Um, all right. Before we before we end the show, Lee Herbert, where would you like people to go to catch up with you and see the other stuff that you're working on? Um, everything is on capture.ink, so capture ink with a K. Um, I will have some, some very interesting course news to announce in about a month's time for a project that I'm working on, which, which I think will be very, very cool for everyone. Cool. Please, yeah, please let me know so I can help get the word out about that. Will do. All right. Matt Granger, what about you, man? What, uh, where can people find you? Uh, well, obviously YouTube's easy, but if you head on over to the website, mattgranger.com, all my workshops and tours are there. So at the moment, I've got Japan, Laos, and Mongolia up that are booking. That's really cool. God, you guys, you guys lead such boring lives. I can't, I can't deal with it. <laughs> get off <laughs> we, the couch. We, we get we. off the couch and get out of there. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for for agreeing to do this. Um, this part two. I think we've we've put a nice bookend on the end of the travel series. So uh, that, that was really good. I hope, I hope folks that are watching get a whole lot out of that. And I know I did. Um, so that's it. That's it for this episode of This Week in Photo. Uh, folks that are watching and listening, it's time to take that lens cap off. This is Twitter.